The next key barrier is shame and shame can really interact with OCD much of the time. I think it's probably safe to say most clients I've worked with will have, you know, a strong inner critic and a sense of not being good enough or actually being bad because of what they're going through or embarrassment um, about how the OCD plays out. And there's the odd exception to this. Occasionally, I've had clients that aren't so dominated by shame and, you know, are like any other person where there's a little bit of that because it's a human quality at times, a little bit of self-criticism or guilt or embarrassment, um, but it's not dominant. But that's the minority of people, I would say. Um, probably an area to research. It'd be interesting to see, you know, more about the correlation um, I think that in a way you can have shame about the experience of OCD and what your mind is doing. So shame about the thoughts and feelings, what it says about you as a person. And really at the heart of many OCD themes, this is, is really a core fear that I'm bad. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be unhappy and miserable or at an evolutional level, I'm going to be thrown out of the group and very vulnerable to, um, you know, death from, from predation, which really is still within our nervous system, that kind of fear. And, um, but then also it can be more, I'm not so shameful about the things I'm frightened about, but it's more the compulsions, the physical compulsions, what it's getting me to do out in the world. So it's embarrassing that I have to go and, you know, do certain physical compulsions for long periods of time and people will hide it all and, and keep it to themselves. And, you know, shame feeds this lack of belief in ourselves that we can just treat these thoughts as thoughts and feelings as feelings, not respond to them with compulsions, not take them particularly seriously, just see them as, you know, thoughts amongst the hundreds of thousands of thoughts we have a day that aren't very meaningful just rising and passing but if we have this core wound of shame and we feel you know there's something wrong with me I'm not good enough and then we are going to have the spotlight on any thought that confirms that and then you know that becomes a vicious cycle to amplify it so you know most people who don't suffer with OCD if you talk to them about intrusive thoughts there's more of a sense of like, of course I wouldn't do that or that's not true or it's not relevant to me. And, you know, even to the point where they actually will reassure themselves, but the reassurance will happen once and it will stick. They will go, oh, that's a weird thought. Oh, that's an odd thing the mind would do. Okay, back to my life. And yet there's no real worry and sense of like, I could be bad and, and this could be true um you know it's not to say normal people don't struggle with shame but you know not on on these topics around you know their character that people will often trust their basic sense of self and their character far more so we could see how building up um self-compassion could really help to make these thoughts less impactful feelings less impactful to build this trust in you know the life direction we have been living before OCD or you know generally where we want to go in our life we're going to trust that more and you know not get pulled off course by these these intrusive thoughts and fears um compassion is also very close to courage historically they are linked together in language and in, in many philosophies and religions and so our compassion itself is very courageous it will help us face erp and and really do what what is important and it might orientate towards others and bring that in as a motivation as well so i'll face the ocd because i want to be you know a loving parent or a good partner or a good friend whatever it might be so uh, you know i think the cultivation of compassion can be so helpful really to facilitate diffusion and more distance from thoughts to add to acceptance and, and deepen that uh, ability to accept difficult feelings and not start doing compulsions to courageously face OCD and to repair some of the wounds that might be in our OCD system. So, 
you know, I think of mental health like a complex system with different inputs and our history can be one of those inputs. And if we have a traumatic history or a history of bullying or a attachment difficulties or even things like over controlling parents or overly worried parents, um, all of that stuff can leave us vulnerable to certain anxieties and fears. It's not saying there's a direct cause all the time, but they can be part of the system and something that feeds in. So if we work on that history with compassion and build up a different relationship with it and, and de-shame our history and learn, you know, why we might be prone to shame and guilt and why that might be a strong pull for us that's going to be something within the OCD system that might be helpful. Certainly it was helpful for me before I worked on OCD recovery. I was very self-critical and really, you know, really harsh and kind of um, really wanted to disown my vulnerable younger self and, and not be that person. Whereas training and compassion really helped me to accept that I was just a vulnerable kid and more prone to anxiety and it's not my fault and you know I did really well to get through that and there were some really tough times but they have made me stronger and that change in self-compassion is helpful I, I think for recovery um, across all mental health challenges but but OCD certainly so I'll alongside you know act skills and ERP work will often be working on self-compassion and often be working on self-compassion to, to history, to our history and experiences of vulnerable self. Certainly if there's trauma there, we would work on that. And I think it's very helpful. So how do we do it? Well, on this channel, there's lots of compassion practices, lots of compassion focused therapy practices, lots of ACT and um, compassionate ACT practices. Again, very inspired by some of the ideas from Russ Harris and some of his self-compassion practices. You can find the kind hand, you can find compassion to the past. Um, so I think using, you know, just trying some of those things out and seeing what resonates with you, maybe grab a workbook. There's lots of good compassion focused therapy books, um, the Compassionate Mind series books, or um mindful self-compassion, or um uh, Russ Harris's ACT books do a lot of good compassion work. Um, uh, so picking up a book that sort of resonates for you could be one way into it. Working, Obviously working with your therapist, finding a therapist that um, does self-compassion practice. You can do the more meditative route where you're training things like love and kindness practice, or you can do it more as, as working a skill in life. How do I step back from my thoughts and bring a compassionate perspective in my self-talk throughout the day regularly and train that skill up how do i orientate to compassionate behavior and actually plan behavior and actions that are self-compassionate and supportive so really two of the simplest things is that compassionate self-talk compassionate behavior spending time to think about that plan it train it and really work it every time your mind goes into that critical place and self-attack and judgment, stepping back. What's a compassionate perspective? What would you say to a good friend? And then refocusing on compassionate action and training that up so that it becomes more of a default capacity and things like love and kindness, meditation, compassion, focused therapy practices, mindful self-compassion practices will all help that. And it's like, you're building the muscle in the gym to then go and compete in the sport, but you can just play the sport and get better. So in this example, just working the skills day to day. And for many people, that's more realistic. You know, a lot of people aren't going to have a dedicated practice, you know, daily practice. Um, so instead, can we bring the skills into life and use them to, to work with the difficulties that come up? In terms of OCD, we have to be careful about reassurance to make sure compassionate self-talk is not functioning as reassurance to try and clear up the uncertainty and make ourselves feel reassured. Instead, it's got to be more about giving us courage and acceptance and the ability to move through difficulty and keep going. And so the function is not I'm going to reassure myself I'm a good person or I'm going to reassure myself this thing won't happen or anything like that. It's more 
you know, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to handle this difficulty. I'm going to stay focused on my goals, despite, you know, what I'm thinking and feeling and coaching yourself through that could be acknowledging the pain and very honestly extending empathy and validation and, and understanding, but then moving into motivation, support, instruction within our self-talk. And um, if we do it this way, then the function is towards goals and values and not trying to move away from OCD and don't get caught up in worrying too much about that. That can become a secondary spike when we start analyzing, is this a compulsion or not? Am I using it compulsively? No, we want to step back from that and just as best we can with that goal of moving forward in life and coaching myself through that. And if in doubt, if you feel like you're not sure if it's reassurance or not, just let it go and work more diffusion and refocusing on the things that matter to you and come back to it. And, you know, we can also choose to not use it in an OCD episode. If we're worried about that, we can use it more in moments of low mood, sadness, other difficult emotions. We might bring in the compassion there, especially if there's depression in the mix. We, I would really recommend using it then. Any questions, drop them below, give it a shot, practice these skills, learn to be kind in your mind. It helps a lot.